Hi, my name is Ralph Stone. I'm a board member of the Montana Human Rights Network and a steering committee member of the Missoula Advocates for Human Rights. Tonight I want to give you a brief history of the Church of the Creator as it has existed over the past nearly 30 years. From Matt Hale, you may get one version. This is another version. The church was formed in 1973 by Ben Klassen, a man born in the Ukraine and raised in Canada and who subsequently moved to Florida, where he found a home in the American right wing. He became a Florida state legislator, enjoyed the support of the John Birch Society, and in 1968 participated in the George Wallace presidential campaign. He finally found his niche in the white supremacist movement in 1973 when he formed the Church of the Creator. He published Nature's Eternal Religion, one of several racist and anti-Semitic screeds that he wrote, and anointed himself Pontifex Maximus of the so-called church. Over the next decade, Klassen slowly built his violent and racist empire. By the early 1990s, the organization included chapters in 20 states and eight foreign countries. Klassen preached that Adolf Hitler was a religious prophet, that Christianity is a Jewish plot, and that members of his church should practice Rehoah, R-O-H-O-W-A, which stand for racial holy war. He proclaimed this holy war as inevitable. Klassen wrote in his book, The Planet is Ours, Rehoah, that the ultimate and only solution is now either them or us. We want to make damn sure it is we who survive. <clears throat> the violent rhetoric became reality on May 17, 1991, when a Florida member of the Church of the Creator, the Reverend George Loeb, murdered Harold Mansfield, Jr., an African-American Gulf War veteran. Two years later, police in Salinas, California, arrested self-proclaimed Washington State Church of the Creator director Jeremiah Kniesel and COTC member Wayne Paul Wooten. While searching their car, officers uncovered <coughs> a cache of weapons, racist literature, and a page from the Portland, Oregon telephone directory listing Jewish agencies and synagogues. Kniesel later confessed to involvement in the July 20th, 1993 firebombing uh, of an NAACP office in Tacoma, Washington. By 1990, Klassen was ready to anoint a successor. He first selected Rudy Stanko, an Eastern Montana activist, but Stanko declined the job when he was released from prison in 1991. He had been sentenced for selling tainted meat to school lunch programs. In May of 1992, Klassen announced that Charles Altvalder of Baltimore would be the new Pontifex Maximus. But Altvalder was arrested and convicted later that year of reckless endangerment after placing a bomb on the porch of a Baltimore uh, County police officer. You can see the checkered history of the Church of the Creator. In the decade of the 1990s, at least 10 church members either pled guilty or were convicted of racially motivated crimes. Klassen uh, eventually committed suicide in 1993 at the age of 75. By that time, the organization was in a state of rapid decline, and it remained so for the next three years. It was in May of 1996 that the so-called Guardians of the Faith Committee of the church anointed Matt Hale to head the organization. He would change its name to the World Church of the Creator, which is what it has remained to this day. Matt Hale doesn't fit the stereotypical image of a white supremacist. He's a graduate of the U Southern Illinois University School of Law. He's young, he's bright, he's articulate, he's a concert violinist. But he had built up a long record of racist activity in neo-Nazi organizations before becoming head of the church. <clears throat> He'd been active in the American White Supremacist Party and the National Socialist White Americans Party, among other groups, before assuming the mantle of the WCOTC. He lives in East Peoria, Illinois, in his father's home, but he travels widely, he speaks often, 
He's a savvy user of the internet to appeal to children as well as women, and he directs his appeal chiefly at young skinheads and young people, but he also appeals to aging bigots. There's a lot more to be said about Matt Hale and about the organization which he heads, but at least this gives you a brief sketch of the organization and sets the stage for our discussions to come. Hi, my name is Ellie Greenwood, and I'm affiliated with an organization here in Missoula, which is called the Missoula Advocates for Human Rights. And the advocates are um, given this time slot that follows the Matt Hale time slot so that we can respond in any way that we see fit, basically, to the tape that you've just seen. Um, we try to do this twice a month, and uh, we know it's late and that if you're watching, you're probably getting tired. And you might also be feeling a little bit uh, perhaps wiped out by the tape that you just saw, or maybe interested in the tape that you saw. What we'd like to do is just part of our contribution to an active and enlivened democracy is to enable you to call in and voice your opinion after seeing that tape and let us know what you thought about it or um, any other reactions that you might have had. If uh, we don't get any calls, we'll assume that everybody slept through the tape, which might not be a bad thing. And um, we'll talk in the interim with um, Kim. And sorry, you're going to have to tell me your name, your last name again. McKelvey. I'm terrible at last names. Kim McKelvey from NCBI about the work that she does in terms of prejudice and racism work in our own community. So until we hear that phone ring, I'm just going to turn to you <laughs> and I'm going to ask you if you have any reactions to the tape, you could, you could let us know how you felt about it or you could also just sort of talk a little bit about the work that you're doing within CBI. Okay. Um, well, I have been doing work with NCBI for a couple of years. The first workshop I went to was a, about two and a half years ago, and I remember getting there and thinking it was going to be another um, workshop where I just learned and learned the whole day long and took everything in, and instead it was really active, and I learned things that I immediately put into use um, regarding skills to help me when I notice prejudicial remarks or slurs or comments or jokes and and so it was a wonderful workshop and because of that I've been really actively involved for the last two and a half years I got trained so I could lead workshops and and then I got onto the board of directors and wow yeah so I just um, do whatever I can to help the organization I just think they're doing really good work in the community so well, how did you first hear about NCBI before you actually took that first workshop um, well I work at Big Sky High School. I run the flagship program there, and at the time, the person who ran the flagship program at Hellgate High School, Claudia Marib, was, and she still is very active in NCBI, but mm -hmm. she's no longer with flagship at Hellgate. Mm -hmm. And she invited me to come and participate in the workshop. And then, and then I said, oh, maybe, because it didn't mm -hmm. sound all that, you know, <laughs> doing another workshop. Um, and then I met Ami just a couple weeks later, and she was doing mm -hmm. um, something for flagship as well. And she invited me to come and participate in the workshop. And then I started thinking, well, these are two people I really, really like and admire and respect. Mm -hmm. And if they're leading this, I think it might be something I want to look into. So that's how I ended up hearing about it. And then mm -hmm. I made myself go on a Saturday. And it turned out to be you know, some of the most mm. fun, most interesting seven hours I've ever spent. Yeah, I think that's very nice to hear that you were a part of a workshop about... Um, a topic that is difficult to deal with for most of us and that you actually enjoyed it mm -hmm. and you found it engaging and it sounds like it it actually took quite it took a hold of you in a way and it sort of changed the way at least in some respects that you sort of saw the work that you do maybe mm -hmm. at and the work that you do with young people or did it also have an effect on just how you relate in general in the community mm -hmm. and your sense yeah. of ownership yeah, I mean, I hate to be cliche about it, but it, it just had a profound effect on me overall. Mm -hmm. it, it definitely had a big effect on the way I relate at work. Mm -hmm. uh, so I work with young people every day, and it wasn't something I'd ever thought about before, that, um, mm -hmm. that it's hard to be a young person in a society, and mm -hmm. that hadn't really ever occurred to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
I always knew I was an advocate for youth, but I never really had anything mm. to put my hat on there. And, uh, and so I, I came away with a real belief that I could make a difference oh, wow. um, in a different way with youth. And then also just in my life in general, and the, the workshop kind of sparked me to, to change a lot about my life. It's so easy to listen to people make a prejudicial remark or slur or anything like that and to just step away or... Yeah, um, or actually step back and feel bad but mm -hmm. not know what to say mm -hmm. or wish that later you'd said something different. Yeah, mm -hmm. or the, you know, the thing I always used to do would just be ignore it. Well, it looks like mm -hmm. we have our first call. Would you like to... No, I guess we don't have a call. No, we're going to wait. We're going to keep talking. I thought I heard the phone ring, but I maybe too. not. <laughs> or telling. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I think there was a phone call, so I'm going to hit line one. Hi, I'd just like to thank you for responding and showing Missoula's positive face to such hateful messages. I have to say that Matt Hale and the Taliban must have much in common, and I'm glad that they don't speak for most of Missoula. So thank you, both of you, for being up this late and being so smart. Well, thanks for calling. Thank you for being up this late and calling in. Well, it's always, nice. it's always hopeful, isn't it, to mm -hmm. get a call like that. And I think especially that should, um, that should give you especially a, sense, a good sense of the work that you're doing, that people can acknowledge that the work that you're doing with prejudice is really difficult. It's hard to get up there and, and um, face that and approach that. I know for, for myself, I've been in situations where um, I felt that there was not overt I don't know, racism or sexism particularly, or even like identifiable prejudice, but I knew in my, in my body mm -hmm. that something felt wrong or that there was something subtle in the humor that people were using maybe even in my workplace mm -hmm. that has made me uncomfortable. And um, I'm wondering, is that a kind of experience that you could take to the workshop and you could sort of process that and get ideas about how to deal with that? I think so. Mm -hmm. I think that, that that's the most common form of oppression or racism is, is it's a, it definitely a little bit more subtle. I think mm -hmm. oftentimes people say mm -hmm. things and they don't even know that they're making a remark mm -hmm. that other people might think of as racist. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the most common type of remark is mm -hmm. where you say it and you don't even know yeah. that anybody would take it. And it could wrong. be hurtful. Mm -hmm. You know, in the wrong situation or in a different situation, it could be. Or it seems like it could just perpetuate sort of um, a stereotype, or it could perpetuate a notion of unfairness that, without even thinking about it, we've all sort of just rallied around and supported. Mm -hmm. You know, without really like stepping back and saying, you know, there's something about that that just doesn't seem right to me. Yeah. Yeah. I guess what I'm interested in also knowing about the workshops is, do you ever do workshops with uh, young people? Um, yes. Yeah. Tell <laughs> me about very, those. It's very, very, it's just really exciting work. Um, we have, we have just had a train the trainer in Missoula about a month ago, mm -hmm. and that was where we trained a whole bunch of people in Missoula to be able to lead these workshops. And 10 or 11 of the people who were at that were high school youth oh from Missoula. Oh my gosh, really? So, huh. um, and they're from Hellgate and Big Sky High School, and they have all sorts of amazing things up and coming but we have a workshop next week where the high school students will be leading the workshop for wow. um, other high school students who are part of the respect clubs the gay straight alliances wow. and the Indian clubs and Asian clubs at both schools that's all going to be in one mm -hmm. workshop yeah wow. we might limit the numbers it seems a little yeah you know 70 people seems a little overwhelming yeah but especially if you're a brand new leader yeah yeah but there will be lots of them leading and really? so hopefully it won't it's always nicer to have a lot of leaders yeah. there together. And it sounds great that they just recently did the training for trainers and that they already get to sort of test out their skills mm -hmm. and facilitate something new. That's yeah, pretty exciting. Exactly. And then one of the students, well then five, the five students at Big Sky High School who got trained have started a club at Big Sky High School designed to um, increase the community's awareness and Big Sky's awareness that we're a very diverse community at Big mm. Sky and also very tolerant. Oh, that's um, nice. And they, their work that they're doing is to bring workshops to the, to the student body for the next um, seven months. Wow. So they'll be offering a workshop 
each month and then mm -hmm. also workshops to faculty and staff mm -hmm. at Big Sky and then also Big Sky faculty and staff and mm -hmm. Hellgate students, Big Sky faculty and staff wow. and Sentinel students or Sentinel faculty and staff and Big Sky students kind of mixing it up around the, wow. the neighborhood. Well when you talk about it, it sounds like the work of NCPI has really permeated the school system, at least in the high schools. Well it's interesting that that's one of the things I like about NCBI is that it's very it's very much led by the people who participate in it mm -hmm. and so we had five high school students decide mm -hmm. to come to the train the trainer and now all of a sudden all this amazing work is happening, is happening because yeah. that's what they want to have happen mm -hmm. um, and so that's really it's just very exciting and so in that way it sounds very organic that mm -hmm. it's very on the ground kind of work Mm -hmm. And that someone goes to the training, and then they take that training out a little bit further, and then it goes a little bit further. And you said you're actually on the board of directors. Mm -hmm. So is that, um, and so th that makes it sound like the organization is maybe a nonprofit. Yes. And so mm -hmm. it's uh, governed by a board. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you guys get your funding from the schools or from grants, or how do you make that work money-wise? Well, that's. And that's changed a lot since NCBI first started. Mm. Um, and we're in a really interesting time with that right now. We, the workshops cost money. Mm -hmm. So if a person would like to have a workshop or if the school has mm -hmm. a workshop, then they pay money to have that workshop come in. And that money pays for um, you know, anything that we have to do to make that workshop happen, the food mm -hmm. and the copies and mm -hmm. all of that good stuff. It also pays for the leaders who lead the workshop to receive enough money to make it worth their while Great. to lead the workshop and um, to pay the national organization for all of the help and support we get from them. And then the, what's happening right now is we're really working hard to, um, to fund the director of our chapter, mm -hmm. our campus, I mean our campus chapter is funded but mm -hmm. our community chapter director isn't funded uh -huh. fully enough. Mm -hmm, so sure. we're working to um, to fund that position so mm -hmm. that it makes it really worthwhile for that mm -hmm. person to lead all of this good work in the community. Well, so it sounds like primarily then, if I understood that right, most of the income for the organization is actually generated from the workshop itself. Mm -hmm. And then maybe there's some grant writing that goes on mm -hmm. to support that. So if folks wanted to support the work of an organization like NCBI, it sounds to me like the very best thing would be to sign up for one of the workshops when you hear about it. And um, maybe you could actually give the phone number mm -hmm. of the organization now so that people could write it down. And if you would like to get a flyer sent to you or be put on a mailing list, maybe you could call this number. So you'd want to call 721-6545. Um, and the person that you would be talking to would be Ami. OK. And actually, speaking of Ami, in a few minutes now, um, probably in about 10 minutes, you're going to be able to see a taped interview with Ami, and she goes into a lot more detail and description of the work of NCBI. And she talks a little bit even about the national work that the organization has done. She talks about the philosophy and the guiding principles of the work. And I think she will give some interesting examples of work that's been actually done in Missoula. So can you get that number one more time? It's 721 65 Five. So in other words, a good way to support the organization would be to call the number, get on a list, and take a workshop. And another way to support the organization, I would imagine if you're interested in um, giving a charitable donation to an organization in Missoula that is trying to um, address issues of prejudice and racism, you could actually just send them a check. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good maybe segue to talk a little bit about the importance of having response programming on MCAT. I had a number of people um, tell me the first time that they watched a Matt Hale tape um, that they were shocked and chagrined that um, such a hateful piece of, um, you know, hateful piece of work would be aired on public television or community access television. And, you know, um, there's the First Amendment, you know, right mm -hmm. for people to have freedom of speech. And, and uh, for the most part, I think we all pretty much defend that because we all want to make sure that we can get our message out. And sometimes it's difficult when someone gets a message out that we don't agree with.
But what I feel has been very positive about MCAT's um, way of dealing with this situation is their ability and willingness to allow us this big response time. Mm -hmm. So that when there is this kind of information put on television, um, and two things happen. One is the World Church of the Creator is no longer sort of a hidden organization with a stealth agenda. It's an organization that's out in the open and people can make more conscious choices about whether it's an organization or a message that they want to affiliate with. And I think sometimes we get the feeling when we think about hate groups and the internet that this is a lot of people. Well, it's more people than we'd like it to be, but as a matter of fact, it's not a lot, a lot, a lot of people. But it is a powerful and acidic and strong message that carries quite a punch. But I think when, you ca when it comes right down to it, we'd rather know that it's there, and we'd rather discuss it, and we'd rather address it than have it be hidden. And it'd be more important for us, I think, to know that it isn't a huge group of people that support sort of hate politics. It's a much larger group of people who actually support tolerance and working to address prejudice than it is people who are working to create situations where uh, people are actually discriminated against and stereotyped and given misinformation. And I know Ami talks quite a bit in our taped interview about that that really is one of the roots of oppression and prejudice is misinformation. Mm -hmm. So that's the second thing that I think is really good about being able to have response time on MCAT and to really be able to say after people see a tape that might be anti-Semitic or might be anti-gay uh, or anti-women or anti-black or anti-any person of color, that there is also an opportunity to respond in a democracy, in a place where you have freedom of expression and the right to free speech. And that is to say, we don't all feel that way. We certainly don't all agree. And we actually think quite the opposite is true and give some good information about, in this case tonight, where people can go to face uh, maybe their misinformation and their own sense of sort of struggle with prejudice mm -hmm. and racism. So, well. We're getting close now, and we're not having a lot of phone calls. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about in terms of NCBI or your work in general? Well, I was thinking about a lot of what you just said, and, um, and I got to hear um, his interview ahead of time. And, I, um, and I'm really looking forward to having that be on the air. I think it's a fantastic interview, and it, it just talks about a lot of wonderful things from building community to uh, what NCBI does, but also just what you can do in the face of any kind of racism or prejudice that you have in your own life, mm -hmm. you know, even just with your own family or yeah. in your workplace. And um, But one of the things I was thinking of as you were talking is how important it is to always keep in mind that each of us, all of mm -hmm. us, have misinformation and mm -hmm. our own our own recordings, or I mean, that's what we call them in NCBI, but this, these things that we're told as very little children and as mm -hmm. we grow up, and by the media or by whoever, mm -hmm. that every single person has those about different yeah. groups and our own groups. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, I have it's them not just Matt Hale, is it? Yeah, we all have them. <laughs> we all have them. And it yeah. just, it, um, it can be so hard to watch something like that because mm -hmm. in some strange way it can sound familiar. You know, mm -hmm. like, oh, I've, yeah. I've, I've heard that before. It can yeah. really also trigger places in you that at first may seem obvious, but later on, upon thinking about it, you realize it's coming from even deeper places mm -hmm. that you're not conscious of and aware of. Mm -hmm. Maybe your own sense of unease and prejudice. Yeah. Well, um... <laughs> this is kind of awkward when the telephone rings because we can't actually pick up the telephone until we hear which line it is. And we're being told it's line one, so we're going to hit line one. Hi. Uh, yes, hello. I, I have a question for you. I uh, wanted to know how you can uh, possibly address some of the things that are going, around or going on around the country with the, uh, the acts of September 11th and some of the prejudice that's going on, uh, especially against the uh, the Arabic uh, type of community and things like that. Can you give us any uh, direction or insight in how to how to kind of address some of the, the prejudice that's happening uh, to those uh, groups in particular? Um, obviously, 
not at the level, or it appears not at the level of the of the hate that, that you uh, were speaking about earlier, or that gentleman was speaking about earlier. But uh, there's still some uh, lots of misinformation and, and acts going on out there uh, directed towards uh, that uh, racial group based on uh, the idea of uh, terrorism. Uh, can you address any of that? Well, thanks for calling, and and I think we'll give it a shot here. Um, have you got some thoughts about that in terms of the work that you do in um, um, NCBI? Mm -hmm. um, I think that, I mean, just by calling in, that's just, <laughs> I just so am pleased that uh, you called because I think that that alone is so supportive of people um, who are from Afghanistan or just are of Arabic descent or um, are receiving that kind of prejudice. Just to hear that somebody is noticing yeah. that that's happening is so supportive. And one of the, the biggest things I think we can do is to notice what may mm -hmm. happen or what is happening and to say it out loud and to make sure that people understand it can be happening. And then to support those people mm -hmm. as much as we possibly can. And then the, you know, the hardest part, of course, is when somebody actually says something, mm -hmm. um, which I've heard certainly in the last month. Yeah. And mm -hmm. how you then respond when somebody says something. And in NCBI, the way of thinking about it, you respond by trying to get the story from that person, you know, where they have that information from, or um, not necessarily talking to them about facts, or mm -hmm. but simply just building a bridge with that person, becoming mm -hmm. um, a friend to that person, even though they've just said a comment that may really may offend have you. Been <laughs> offensive to um, you. Instead of turning away and saying, "Oh, I can't believe you said that," or that's so unbelievable. Instead, you try to elicit further conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and in doing that, do you feel like sometimes you can then give information, at least from your perspective, that maybe the people who live in this country now um, that are, have come from the Middle East or Afghanistan have every right to be here? I mean, would that be appropriate? I think it or just is that all depends on how, you know, how, how the conversation goes. How much that bridge has been built. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes a long time mm -hmm. to build it, enough that mm -hmm. you can then give information, and sometimes yeah. you can do it right away, yeah. almost immediately. So, Well, I would concur. I really appreciate the caller calling in, and um, even though we didn't have a lot of calls tonight, I'm hoping that oh, we do have one more call, and um, we do only have about one more minute. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to take this call. Oh. We're on that rather interesting... TV time. <laughs> but thanks for calling in. Anyway. Yeah, but thanks for calling in. And uh, I was just saying, though, even though we didn't get a lot of calls, it was great to have this time with you mm -hmm. here and to find out a little bit more about your work in the community. I always feel so grateful to people who work with young people in Missoula and give them the hope that it sounds like you must give them. Thanks. So thanks for doing your great work. And if anyone is interested in getting more interest information about um, the Missoula Advocates for Human Rights. I believe we run our telephone number along the bottom of the show when we have an interview. So please call us too.